All right, I am very excited uh, for today's podcast, for this panel episode. Um, honestly, I'm not just saying this because you guys are sitting in front of me here on Zoom, but three of my favorite people in the industry, I think the first time I met all three of you, uh, just your energy, your positivity. Um, I just love speaking with you guys as much as I can. So this is another excuse to do just that. Uh, very pleased and honored to um, have all three of you on today. I'm gonna introduce you guys individually. Then would love to have you let the audience and the listeners know a little bit about your role and what you oversee day to day. So I'll start uh, with you, Tatiana, obviously the VP and head of digital and social and strategy at the uh, Indiana Pacers and Sports Entertainment. But would love for you to give uh, the listeners kind of a sense of your day to day and what you oversee day to day. Awesome. Thank you, David, for yeah. allowing me to be on this conversation today. Um, Again, my name is Tatiana Holyfield Arthur. I am the Vice President and Head of Digital Strategy for Pacers Sports and Entertainment. So that includes our NBA property, which is the Indiana Pacers, um, our WNBA property, which is the Indiana Fever. We also have Pacers Gaming, our eSports, Bankers Life Fieldhouse, our arena, and um, Fort Wayne Mad Ants, our G League team. So we have an array of entertainment properties. And uh, prior to this, I worked in New York. I worked for BT Networks. I worked for NBC Universal. And um, I I'm just ready to bring this conversation about because we're going to get, get into, it. <laughs> into how sports brands have, uh, have been challenged with this topic as well. Awesome. Um, next, I want to bring in the co-founder and head of creative at Pop In Creative, Lori Hall. We were originally introduced by our mutual friends over at Turner, worked together at TV One. Now, obviously, you've gone and ventured on your own to this amazing new venture, Pop In Creative. But uh, tell us a little bit about it. Sure. I uh, ventured on my own with an amazing partner, Jessica Lane, which I'm sure you'll get to. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so co-founder and head of creative for Poppin uh, Creative. We started Poppin Creative because we wanted to see brands get it right at multicultural marketing. And we were hearing too many times that brands couldn't find great uh, agencies that specific, you know, specifically um, targeted multicultural audiences. Now we do all marketing. Jessica, Jessica and I both were at Turner. We were at TV One, and now we have Pop and Creative. But there's still a void in terms of one agencies that uh, brands feel they can go to with the right expertise for these audiences, and two, uh, the help that's really needed. It's not just about marketing; it's about getting the entire message right. Um, and that's what we're here for with Pop and Creative. Awesome. You, you team me up perfectly. So Jessica, I'll, uh, I'll throw it to you now. Sure, sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Lane. And uh, uh, Lori and I also have similar backgrounds. So I started off at Turner Broadcasting, also Warner Media, TBS and TNT. I uh, also went to TV One and then again, made that big leap to open up my own agency. By the way, how bad my... was TV One when they found out you both were leaving them? They're like, oh, my God, <laughs> you're killing me. No hate, no hate. Awesome. <laughs> that's a tough, that's a tough loss. <laughs> well, thank you, David. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, yeah, so we went out on this leap. And so Lori and I decided to create and launch our own agency. And so not to say, to recap a lot of things that Lori did, because she was spot on. We saw a need in the marketplace. We saw lots of our friends. Um, so I also went to a business school at Kellogg's. So I have lots of brand marketers friends. And we used to have conversations day after day about how Oh, I'm looking for some, I'm looking for multicultural agencies and I just can't find one. Or there's like one multicultural agency that everyone uses. So all of our creative kind of looks similar. And yeah. I saw, we saw that need in the marketplace and we we're like, we need to jump on it. We need to tap into mm -hmm. it because there's space, there's space for all of our voices. And there is a space for this kind of expertise. And clearly given the topic we had at hand, there's no better time than right now to talk Man, about it. I was just going to say, you guys launched your business well before our country changed in a big, big way over the last couple of months. Um, but wow, like you guys are positioned very well, I think in terms of people wanting to make a big change. Um, all right, so yeah, I wanted to just have a conversation. I wanted to educate people. I wanted to educate myself as, as a white CEO that owns an agency as well. I think I've been doing a lot of listening and learning and trying to uh, better our processes and our protocols and things like that um, and just want to grow and be more diverse and all those things. So I'm interested to hear from all of you today. So I'll, I'll throw it to Tatiana to start things off. I think to, or in order to add context to what we want to talk about today, which is, you know, we want to educate brands and companies 
on how to go beyond the lip service and what you can do. We're all marketers. We all have this amazing ability to talk to millions and millions of people every day through our clients, through our brand, through our social media platforms. And how can we use that for good? How can we use that in the proper way? So in order to add context to that discussion, though, I do want to start off with the broader topic, which is this entire movement, Black Lives Matter, and everything that's been going on in our country the last month or so. So Tatiana, I would throw it to you and just say, I guess, what are your initial thoughts or um, just your statement on what's going on in the country right now? I'm very um, exhausted, if I can be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a community, uh, I'm tired. As a community of, of people, I'm tired. And I think all of us in this moment are just feeling very overwhelmed with it all coming down at once, right? Um, starting with coronavirus and that taking a toll on the entire nation, <laughs> the entire global <laughs> universe, really. And then from there, the impact of all of us having to pivot our day-to-day -day lives, our business, the revenue impact and everything else that comes along with it, yeah. to be in that moment and then all of these racial um, injustices occur. And so for people who may have had, you know, family members or themselves or whoever to um, have to deal with coronavirus the way I did. My sister caught coronavirus. Mm. And then on top of that, my sister lives in Minneapolis oh. where all of this, you know, sparked for this to become an accelerator of these conversations bubbling up just makes you mentally exhausted. And for me in my day to day, um, to be compiled with the NBA season now coming back in action, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, <laughs> like, can I just have one second? Can I have a day, <laughs> please? One yeah. second. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's just where I'm at with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Laura, I'd love to get your uh, just overall mm -hmm. thoughts as well. Yeah. First of all, you know, Tatiana, bless you and bless your family. That is a lot to go through. Um, I can't even imagine having a sister in Minneapolis and she had coronavirus and you're having yeah. to do corporate. Um, I think we've heard a lot uh, from our friends and people we know um, in terms of being exhausted. Black people are exhausted everywhere. Um, this young lady wrote an amazing article that was just so truthful and to the point about your black employees are tired. They're exhausted. I learned that's an amazing article. Yeah. 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 And, she, and she refused to syndicate that article because she was like, no, I wrote it for medium. I think it was medium. She wrote it for, she's like, and that's where it's going to stay. I don't need to try to make money off of the, whatever it is. Um, and I applaud her for that, but, um, it's really a lot and we're seeing it probably even more so than people who are not within the black community because mm -hmm. all of us are posting and reposting because we're on fire about it. We're on fire about it. We're mad about it. Um, we want to see real change. As you said, it's over 400 years of, um, being oppressed in, in one regard or another. Um, and the conversations that are happening behind the scenes, um, with employees, with entrepreneurs, with entrepreneurs, whomever, are that this has been a problem. It's now, you know, becoming a national crisis because we are tired of seeing the same thing. I think uh, Will Smith says something to the effect of, you know, it's not that it wasn't happening, it's just being filmed now. So now there's proof. If there was not a tape of George Floyd being killed, you know, would this still have erupted as much? We, we, we've been mad. Right. But now you guys are seeing what we've been knowing. And I think that's where everybody can come unite and say, that's wrong. Um, so I think that the current state of affairs, I am proud of the progress being made. I think there's a lot more to go. Um, Jessica and I, you know, speak very passionately about this. That's why we created the response guide. We've seen brands respond to it. And uh, when we see them respond, we're like, oh, that was great. Or we're like, mm, those are just words. And I think it's important to, um, make sure that companies know that you can't just say something and disappear. My biggest concern is that once the protests are done, that companies will say, whew, good, we got yeah. a way to just 
having to post something on Instagram. So carry on business as usual. Yeah. That's not what we want. We want measurable change. We want specific change. We want access to the executive ranks of companies, not just keeping us in middle management or below. Um, we want to be able to thrive in our nation just like anyone else is going to thrive. Um, you know, we're not asking for anything exceptional. We're asking to be treated just as well as everyone else. And knowing that we have 400 years where we've been held back, companies need to ramp up. It's time to ramp up. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's how I feel. Time to overcorrect for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Jessica? Yeah, so it's so crazy because I feel like on the one hand, I echo you all sentiments in terms of exhausted, tired, angry. But then also I have this other side of me that's kind of excited about the prospects of real change. And so you're kind of battling this dual consciousness within yourself about being really upset that people have lost their lives. People have, you know, people have been challenged in, re in really crazy ways, but you know that you can see that there could be change, there can be change on the future. And so I'm, what I'm really excited about too is just to see all that almost that double consciousness that like the wall between that kind of start to evaporate. So, you know, I've heard and I've seen people come crying in meetings when senior leaders bring this up. That would never have happened two weeks ago. Like I can't even begin to imagine anybody black coming to a meeting and then literally breaking out in tears. <laughs> I feel like that's what they tell us. Don't ever do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, but that has taught, that type of, those type of walls have been able to be like brought down. And so people have been really able to have these really deep conversations on the meaningful conversations to talk about what it means to be black and see all these things. Whereas, Normally, day to day, we don't even acknowledge that in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of that progress. Yeah. Can, can I add just one thing, David? Yeah, of I think what you said, Jess, was so on point. I feel like this is probably one of the first times where Black employees and Black people can try to bring their full self to the job. And, Absolutely. and you know, the, the non Black allies or the non Black leadership, they're finally acknowledging, like, oh, Things must be hard or, or things must be a little crazy right now. We see it, we hear, we feel it. And we have the ear of those in, in positions of power and positions of leadership. And I think that it's, I, I've seen some commendable efforts being made by a lot of companies, but I've also seen that in some very conservative companies like law firms, I have several friends who are partners at law firms, they're finally able to speak out and say, well, you know, this person has been doing great work and for so long and you guys haven't promoted her, what's up, you know? And, and she's an African-American woman, et cetera. So they're now given, I don't wanna say the permission, but they're giving the leeway, the invitation to speak up. And I think that is positive uh, signs of change. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yeah, the key One word thing. right now is accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. One thing that a lot of my my black friends have mentioned that also adds to the exhaustion is white people asking you, what what should I do? What can I do? And it's like not really your job <laughs> uh, to have to lay out a plan of here's what you have to do as a, a white person or a person in leadership. Um, and I think Kenny's, Kenny the Jet Smith on NBA on TNT made a great point. Like when you want to look into the dark, you know, um, issue that is sex trafficking in, in, in different countries or what have you. You don't go to someone and say, what should I do? You educate yourself and you start to find how can I help this situation? How can I enact change? But that's a lot I'm sure that uh, adds to that exhaustion as well is how can I help when at the end of the day, I think each individual is responsible for educating their self. Um, and I'm, I'll talk to you, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that. I, I do. If, if anyone <laughs> follows me on LinkedIn, they will see that that was one of the first posts I put up on this subject because I'm usually not one to be very radical on, on my LinkedIn channel, but yeah. I could, it was like it, itching me. I had to say it because um, after George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight on social media, and people reacted to it, especially the people in my circles or that I, you know, see on a day-to-day -day basis who are not black. The first thing they says is, what can I do? And for so many of them, they came to me and said, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah. And I was just that. Now the, like, now the weight's back on your shoulders that yeah. you already have. Yeah. yeah. There was something about that that just irritated me to the core because I'm like, I shouldn't have to tell you what to do. And so I went on my little uh, LinkedIn rant about don't ask me <laughs> about what, what, um, what you can do to help 
look at yourself, look within your heart and think about what it is you think you can do. And I'll be honest, there are some people who are just clueless and they don't know where to start. And that's fine. That's where the education piece of it comes in at is start with educating yourself. And then there's realize, a great tool called Google. Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> and, and realize that slacktivism does not count. Wow. You posting a black graphic with white text does uh, not count. On it. <laughs> Love it. You 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 hitting the like button on your black friend colleagues post does yeah. not count. Mm-hmm. Slacktivism does not count if you don't huh. have action behind it. Please train so, that. Let's let's start <laughs> here. So let's just all stand up and unite as one in a plan of action. And it was so funny because my my colleague the next day she came to me and she said, Tatiana, I'm so sorry. I saw your LinkedIn post and I'm sorry that I asked you what I could do. <laughs> She owned, it. she owned it. I said, you know what? But, but she was actually the only one who came to me in what I felt was an okay way because she didn't just say, Tatiana, what can I do or what, you know, tell me. She actually said, what can I do? And I was thinking about this. And mm-hmm. she came with some solutions mm-hmm. that she thought and she wanted to run it by me. And that's where I'm like, perfect. That's where you start. So she came back and she said, you know what? I have a child. He's biracial. It's important for me. So I'm, I want to start with figuring out how do we make this not um, continue for generations to come. So I'm going to start with children's books and I'm going to read. And she like started to think of ways in her heart that she felt most genuine on how she could make that impact. So I, I, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now, but this—that's where I start with it. <laughs> well, right. and I don't know. My mind when when this whole thing happened with George Floyd, my mind immediately went to Rodney King, because it, it frustrated me so much as a human being that we've gone 30 years, and that was on tape too, and that was you know 14 officers, four of which um, I think used their baton 56 times, and nobody got charged, nobody went to jail. And I feel like we've made so much growth as our country in so many different areas, but for whatever reason, um, holding holding officers accountable when they do injustice, that, that we, we've made no progress, it seemed like. So I, I want to get your thoughts, Lori. Do you think it, it all had to do with coronavirus and obviously the back-to-back-to-back of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and the Amy Cooper situation? And George Floyd was just so blatant that like the entire country said enough because in my lifetime, I'm sure you guys lifetime as well. I've never seen um, outrage outside the black community as well, where everybody was kind of coming out and saying, this is ridiculous. Mm, that's a good question. I think I have mixed emotions about how I answer this one, to be honest. Like I'm a little torn internally and getting a little emotional. Um, so forgive me. I mean, I, I'm going to just speak from the cuff. You know, I think that young people today are are even more intertwined, like racial, racially, you know, generationally, all the all of that. And I feel like, um, you know, with a lot of biracial kids, and they, I just feel like they, there's just more integration in terms of sure. races and everything like that today. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that you know the young people have really risen up in a great way um, in response to seeing the George Floyd tape. I do think that instances in the past that have happened, you know, I'm not going to go all the way back to Rodney King uh, because that was so long ago, but in terms of Kaepernick and when he knelt and then he got ousted from the NFL and then you fast forward to, you know, like Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, you know, and then as of recent, you know, as you mentioned, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, which was in my home state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, And, and then George Floyd, I feel like, it, it became so egregious because of the condensed timing and because you saw the life go out of this man. Yeah. I had no idea when I saw the George Floyd video that I was watching someone die. Mm-hmm. 
I saw it when it first started circulating and I don't think anybody had it in the caption kind of like this is the video where he loses his life or you know this man has died so I'm watching it and I'm like oh that's police brutality that sucks you know and I, I, I'm feeling you know for George in in that way and then when you hear him scream you hear him say he can't breathe you hear him scream for his mother and then you see his body go lifeless mm. I think that spoke volumes and people could see that this was so inhumane that something's got to be done and it wasn't just black people who were gonna do something it's everyone so the protesters out there are not just black people they're white people they're asian people they're south koreans or this or that people around the world have caught on because when you see that inhumane treatment so up close and so just unrelenting he did not back up for a second i think that that's what sparked the big, the big movement at this time. It's always been a movement. People have always been fighting for it. We have civil rights leaders of the past who are helping the young people of today. This has been an ongoing fight, but to capture it on tape to the point where he takes his last breath, I think that's what really set things in motion. Yeah, and I don't know if everybody saw, I know Tatiana, I'm sure you saw, Greg Popovich came out with, I thought, a great statement, which the, the, the face on the officer looking at the camera, like when I saw the video, I wanted to jump into my phone and like drop kick that officer. But I know even if I was there, I would have been shot killed. The same people that were yelling at him to stop, you know, t as a human, you want to save someone's life, but then these four officers probably would have shot you. You can't, there's not, and that's what was so troubling, I think for all of us to see. But anyways, Greg Popovich said that that was the first time a lot of white people have seen an officer stand there and look into a camera like that. Like, I don't care, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I don't care if he dies. I don't care. And that, that was the the huge difference. Um, um, Jessica, I'm sure you have some something to add there. Yeah, um, I definitely think that's part of it. And I think that the protests are part of it as well. I feel like this is a controversial statement, but the protests, that civil unrest, that that combustion that happened in cities across America, I think that that really opened people's eyes as well. Because let's face this, like George Floyd, he died... I can't remember the exact date, but it was at least five to six to seven days before this really became an issue that took mm -hmm. over major TV, that CNN was covering it 24 hours. It took days for that to happen. So I don't really think that his death alone really would have gotten people to shake, kind of shake loose of what's happening. I feel like it was a civil unrest. It was a protest that across kind of across America. I feel like that really put on the spotlight and that comp compounded with the fact that we're in a pandemic. It really felt like the world was on fire. And when the world yeah. is on fire, people, when something's on fire, people come running with water, but it has to be on fire first. You're not going to, you know, if it's, oh, you know, if something just breaks and falls, you're not really that concerned about it. But if something's on fire, you're going to move real quick to make sure it kind of the flames go out. And I think that that was kind of a, ma a major, major part of it. Can I, can I add something yep. to that? Of course. Um, for me, I think my coworker called me and she said, Tatiana, I need to ask you something. She said, why do you think it was the George Floyd murder that became the catalyst for everything else? Why, why did white people and all other nations mm -hmm. stand with him when this has been happening many times? This, you know, we didn't get this type of reception for Ahmaud Arbery. We didn't get this type of reception for Brianna. And the only answer I had to give her was, for me, this was the first time, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful or flippant way, but this was the first time that white people were not able to poke holes in the story. No devil's advocate. You're so right. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they saw it on camera with their own two eyes and there was no way anyone in their right mind can say that was not right. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the case of Ahmad, there were holes being poked in the story. Right. Like people were like, oh, well, maybe he was going into these houses, you know, trying to steal stuff. In the case of Brianna, oh, well, maybe, you know, her her boyfriend was this and that. Like people mm -hmm. come up with reasons and excuses mm -hmm. to why they want to turn a blind eye to what's happening. But this was the very first time that there was nothing that they could do but admit that this was inhumane. Agreed. And let's not forget, I think the, um, I'm not sure, I think it was a young lady, but the person who videotaped this was like 13 years old. Hmm. 
13. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Yes, I'm pretty sure it was a, a girl, 13 years old, and then you hear the guy's voice talking about how, you know, this is wrong, bro, this is wrong, bro. But the girl was 13 and watched these cops who were supposed to protect and serve. And a lot of them do. There, there are those that don't, right? And, and we, we see that on the tape. But she's 13 and she stood her ground to get it on tape. And had she not, we wouldn't have this, I don't even know what to call it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have the proof that this has been happening so often and now we're finally getting it in front of everybody else's eyes to see and to, and to, and to rise up as well. So I think that uh, kudos to that uh, young person for doing that. Yeah, I think there's like this interesting way, um, especially like, you know, white people act to in terms of those stories, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, like there's no way a cop would just as a human just like shoot somebody like without actual cause. Like there's like this, I think Tatiana mentioned like that blind spot, like you don't want to believe another human would be that despicable. So therefore there had to be some type of reason outside of being racist or just being unjust or doing some committing murder. Um, so I think that I, I, I agree with all statements there. Uh, Jessica, any, anything to add on that point? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is just one thing. I know that we, and I and I feel like obviously George Floyd was a horrible situation, but you know what situation got me just as angry? It was the scenario with Amy Cooper and the, uh, oh. in the in the central uh, in Central Park. That honestly mm -hmm. got me just as heated, and especially as we transition this conversation about what the everyday person can do and what companies can do, as people forget that racism and these inequalities and these like unconscious bias exists within normal people, not just cops, racist cops holding guns. It exists in normal people. So to watch wow. Amy Cooper, to watch that whole scenario go down also on video and on camera of her having like an altercation with him, but then weaponizing her voice to immediately call the cops and say this African-American man is threatening me in the park and watch her say it over and over again while strangling her dog, but mm -hmm. watch her say it over and over again. That got me so upset because there are so many Amy Coopers running wow. around that we yeah. interact with every day yeah. that are within our organizations. And, and each she and gets every the benefit day. of the doubt, even though she's a lion scumbag. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. But really quickly, there's a place in Georgia called OK Cafe. And my mom used to love to eat at this place. Not anymore. Um, but they have a, uh, Georgia flag that has a Confederate flag symbol in their place of business. And it's owned by a white woman named Susan DeRose, I believe. I know her name is Susan. And she put a banner out that said, all lives with positive purpose matter. Right. <laughs> Something like that. I'm from, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. And this is in a prominent part of Atlanta called Buckhead. And so that banner got people talking. And then they did a, um, an OK Cafe tea party outside, right? Oh, Lord. And <laughs> she said it was because of taxation without representation. And she's trying to speak up for businesses. Someone called her out, wrote an email. And her response was to the effect of, um, why, why should, you know, our businesses be looted? You know, it's not about, you know, um, you know, black lives mattering, you know, we have pride, it's white pride. And she just goes on and on. And she's like, somebody was killed, but you know, our businesses are going down. So, and, and the way that the, the, the response that she had was worded, I felt the racism rise up out of it. And it's what I lived through when I was living in Atlanta as a kid. And, and part of the reason why I actually don't want to move back there, even though Atlanta's a wonderful city and they have a wonderful mayor. Um, it's just, you feel that racism, you feel it. And, and she felt justified and speaking out to the newspapers about it and the 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 wording is all wrong and um it's also all right because it's the way she truly feels and so that is now being highlighted people are now boycotting it there are students at the uh, private schools it's predominantly white private schools i went to one called westminster um love the love it school in atlanta uh they're all marching students students are marching they are protesting and 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 they're trying to fight against this and it, it really is systemic it's 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 the things that people don't say there are a lot of people that are not saying how they feel you know there are regular people who still feel this way like amy cooper um and it's and it's so prevalent i know you guys have seen all the videos on instagram going around where people are calling you know black women an n-word and then going to the police there's one where this woman goes to the police and she called this woman an n-word and she's like i'm overwhelmed this black lives matter it's just too much Lady, lady, imagine how it's felt for over 400 years yeah. for our 
Thank you. I think it's important to remember that um, not only is there a blind spot to Tatiana's point, but there is also that quiet racism that people are not coming out and saying, but they absolutely feel. Yeah, and Tatiana, you mentioned because there's a lot of people that listen to this program that work in, in sports and social, and we're going to get into that, obviously. But um, you mentioned something that I didn't even realize, which was the Indiana Fever. Um, was it around the same time when Colin Kaepernick, they also decided to take a knee? But what you said to me was really educational for me because I think it speaks to why so many brands and people in the NFL were so scared at that point to do it. But we'd love for you to share that story with the Fever, if you don't mind. Yeah, I wasn't with the company at this time, but I yeah. think it was back in 2016. And um, this is, you know, when Colin Kaepernick took the knee. And if you all recall, I believe at that point in time, uh, the NFL, you know, had their stance on certain matters. And the NBA as a league and as a players association decided that they would not um, – take a knee. However, they gave their players the option to not stand out on the court during the anthem, right? Yeah. And so people who want to stay in the locker room could or whatever. Well, in uh, the fever, our WNBA team actually decided to go out and take a knee. The players took a knee on the court at that point in time it was something that they chose to do as players. They did not tell anyone in leadership that they were doing it, probably because they were scared that someone would stop them from doing it, right? And it became a huge ordeal. The company lost 23 plus percentage of revenue of season ticket holders and so forth who um, were very much against it. And, um, even the impact, residual impact that it had on the Pacers, you know, we had certain season ticket holders who say, oh, you know, if the Pacers do this, I'm, I'm going to pull my season tickets, you know, stuff like that. And um, to this day, those feelings are bubbling back up in our company. And even internally, we've had several discussions because there are still a lot of people who feel that taking a knee was very anti-military yep. mm. and people don't think that this is the same situation. I've gotten into debates lately around if this is the same situation or not. And if you really do your research and it goes back to educating yourself, right? If you really do your research and you find out why Colin Kaepernick took the knee, it was because he spoke with a person in the military who told him that taking a knee was a symbolism of honoring or, you know, whatever the rather, meaning. Rather than sitting on the bench, it was more respectful, yeah. Respectful, right. Yeah. So yeah. he said, so he did it out of respect to say, mm -hmm. this isn't about your flag. It's about, you know, I want to fight for black and brown people to be treated as humans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that continues to be an issue. And I think people need to get over that right now. <laughs> well, and we yep. see police officers, military taking knees during protests. I think people get it now. And I've had difficult conversations with family and friends. And I think the three things, and um, the three things that have come up that I think were really controversial were the Colin Kaepernick kneeling, obviously. The term white privilege, I think really white people didn't understand because they thought like how, you're saying I never worked hard, you're saying that I didn't bust my ass, you're saying I didn't work 20 hour days. And I think people are starting, the good news about all this going on is they, they're they getting it now. They're getting the 400 years and the oppression and the injustices and, and the uh, you know racism and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, so I think that's what's, and to your point earlier too, Lori, like we all work in social, we all work in marketing. The beautiful thing about that is we don't have to just read a police report and hope that that's what happened. <laughs> you right. know, the actual results can come out. And that's what's, I guess, as we kind of transition to to marketing and social, that w that's what gives me a lot of hope is I think, you know, um, the truth is out there. We can hold it, to your point, Jessica, people accountable. Um I would love to start with Jessica in terms of you guys put out together a really great um, guide shortly after this happened about how brands 
um, responded to this entire movement. Um, what, what do you think were some of the things that brands got wrong or got right as far as their statement or their way to, to kind of help the movement? Yeah, so I feel like, um, and it's funny because uh, as we're working on this guide and then we kind of put it out and then we realize, oh wait, there's another phase to this guide. So like to that point, I think there's kind of two different phases that are happening, get real marketing with it. I feel like at first there was this kind of this awareness phase where people were like, something is going on and brands just wanted to make people aware that we see what's going on. We're, we're saying that we are supporting the black community while they're behind it. And we're saying that we're thoroughly disgusted at what's going right. on. And so I feel like that was that first wave is just honoring the fact that two weeks ago, we didn't, we didn't talk about racism. And then yeah. on this day, now in this moment, we're going to say that we see this racism. We know that you are hurting and we stand behind you. So it's that first phase. And I think, I feel like there are a couple of companies, like the one thing I was really impressed with, um, so Viacom, CBS, so I want to say MTV, VH1, a couple of companies, they actually had a like eight minute and 40 sec- 46 second, like moments of silence or moments of tribute just dedicated to George Floyd and what happened. And I feel like that speaks, especially in the awareness phase, that speaks tremendously to saying, okay, not only am I saying I'm acknowledging what happened, but I'm willing to put sacrifice valuable airtime, which could be commercials, which could be programming, which could be anything. So you're sacrificing monetization and putting Mm -hmm. something on the line to say that, no, this is way more important. So I think things like that, that have really, uh, surprised me in terms of how brands are responding and how brands are responding well. And then as we transition to this new phase, when now it's like, okay, well, what's next? It's about the action um, and how we really, how companies really address, okay, there is racism out there on the streets with police, but there's also racism right here in our houses. And how do we feel like, how can we take steps to actually address that? And so one of the things that really stood out to me in terms of a company who did it pretty early on um, was Uber. When Uber kind of had their letter from the actual CEO addressing some of the things that are happening, not only did he address it and say, we stand behind you, but then he said, well, wait a second, I'm going to tell you about, these are things that we're going to do within our company to change and make sure the implicit biases that exist in the world starts to get eradicated here at Uber. And so he offered a platform and a resource for black owned businesses and black owned restaurants. He was going to support them at Uber Eats. He even said that he was going to work through kind of DNI, and um, as we talk about this pipeline for for employment and for Black employees and Black talent, he was going to start building that pipeline. And then on the, the I feel like the final thing that just got me so excited because I'd never seen anything like that was that he said that he was going to tie he was going to make it a business objective and tie people's and tie executives' salary to making sure that they were accountable to achieving the things that they said they were going to do. And to me, that was like the, you know, as we talk about accountability, that was like the best of all worlds. Like he said, he was going to announce it. He had change in action. He said, please hold me accountable because I'm holding them accountable to seeing some change um, within our organization. That's awesome. And then Lori, I guess, you know, Blackout Tuesday and kind of that week and how all these different companies were either saying a lot or not saying anything at all, which we definitely saw as well. Um, If you're consulting at that time, like what was your your number one objective that you would let your clients know how to approach it in terms of uh, participating in blackout Tuesday. Yeah, right. You know, I don't even know the genesis of blackout Tuesday, to be honest. Um, I found myself, um, and I apologize. I'm having notifications. I found myself, um, wishing that it was tied to an even bigger initiative. Um, because as soon as I saw blackout Tuesday, as, as a black person, I was like, ooh, let me jump in. And then I saw a lot of um, people posting, please don't hashtag Black Lives Matter yeah. because then it will black out all of the great work we've done when you search right. for that hashtag and then you'll get nothing. So that's actually very oppressive instead of progressive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was like, don't hashtag Blackout Tuesday. So there were all these like nuances and I all think these it rules, bubbled, yeah. all these rules that were not listed out, but it bubbled up and I love the intent of it. Um, but I wish it was paired with uh, maybe a, a, a town hall, a rally, a this or that, something where, okay, it's Blackout Tuesday, but what are we going to post? Not just what are we going to you know, not post? Um, so I do, from a marketing perspective, the marketer in me was see, seeing the opportunity and was thinking about, I was thinking about how can we level this up? Um, so I think that companies that participated, I know Apple participated in Blackout Tuesday and they, um, uh, you know, basically the for you section was disabled and they had um, a playlist that was specifically for the revolution, I believe. Um, so I think that was interesting, but I didn't see anything else from Apple Music. So I'm not sure if they 
had a follow-up or not. We, we're currently researching lots of brands and seeing lots of examples. And people are sending us examples too. Um, yeah. But I'd like to evaluate that one even further. I just think that as time goes on, I think there was a need for an initial response. And for the companies that, that created a, a genuine uh, initial response, I applaud them because they got in there early. Um, and even in our guide, we say timing is everything. You know, silence yeah. speaks volumes. Um, and then now that we're seeing companies tie it to executive compensation, to me, that makes my heart happy. Um, I am absolutely never going to get over the deaths and the and the um, obstruction, you know, that black people have faced, the injustice black people have faced. Um, but I'm also not going to hold it against the country forever. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that um, our lives for the ones that are lost are not in vain. And we're starting to finally see some real progress. I just don't want it to stop. I don't want companies to stop just because the protests might be dialing back some. Yeah. I don't want, um, uh, you know, executives to stop creating a path for, for uh, growth for black employees specifically. Um, given that, you know, this is all, you know, spurring up because we're seeing the racism, the systemic racism and the impact to our society in the most gross ways. I do feel that even if you think your company is not racist and does not have a racist culture, throw that out the window and just know that after 400 plus years, black people have been pushed down so far in the food chain that it's been so hard for us to rise up for ourselves, for our families, um, for our future children, you know, for our children's children. So just know that we've been starting behind the starting block for so long and you need to yeah. do something to help empower, you know, black employees, black vendors, black suppliers, et cetera, because we've, we've had such a lopsided um, chance and opportunity for so long. Can, can I ask all three of you a question as, as marketers? Um, and while we're talking about marketing and social media, did you all see the share the mic now social yes, media? Yes, that was the yes. best. That yes. was the best. I, I actually, I want to ask you all, and David, jump in on this too. Like, yeah. what do you all think about that campaign? Because oh. I don't know. I have mixed feelings, but I want to hear other people's perceptions about it. Oh, I, I guess I can jump in because I loved it. So for the, <laughs> I thought it was, <laughs> I love marketing so much that I'm always like, mining examples of like great marketing. And, and I love that. And I'm not sure who came up with that idea, but um, there were some great marketers who participated. So share the mic, hashtag share the mic um, was about uh, women uh, partnering together, black women and white women and black women were going to be taking over or they did take over the Instagram pages or the social media pages mm -hmm. of white, powerful, influential women. And the black women were powerful and influential as well. What I loved about it from a pure marketing perspective is I thought it was genius that they realized that we can speak to our own audience all day. They know how we feel. You see my uh, Black Lives Matter posts on my Instagram. You see me posting things about injustice. You see that I'm trying to spur change for the future. You see that we're doing a response guide. We're preaching to the choir. And that's something that I often hear when we're talking about racial injustice, not just now, but in years past when it's come up in, in company settings or um, in marketing settings. You know, it's like we're preaching to the choir. I worked at TV yeah. One. At TV One, if we are like, we need change. Okay, we, we know that. The people yeah. that need to know it are the people who are not of the community or the people who are not experiencing this and don't have firsthand knowledge of it. So what I loved about it is the black women leverage the reach and influence of the white women they partnered with and the white women open that up for them to get to their audience. Because the white women might have people who do not know firsthand about what's going on with Black Lives Matter and what, why it's so important that people are protesting for change. And I love that because if you have a court, it was Kourtney Kardashian and one of my favorite marketers uh, who I don't know personally, but I just, I, I, I'm a fan, uh, Badass Bose, uh, Bozema St. John. Um, Bozema St. John took over Kourtney Kardashian's feed. And if I had to guess what Kourtney Kardashian fans look like, I'm sure it's a plethora of everybody across the U.S., and I'm sure there's a significant percentage that are non-black. And I'm just thrilled that she opened up her platform, as well as all the other women. They opened up their platforms for a black woman to share why it's so critical and important to her that we fight for change right now. And I, I, it's an education that I think you can't pay for. 
you know, some people have millions and millions of fans. That's a reach you can't really pay for. So for them to combine together in that way in order to get the message out broadly into audiences they might not be reaching already, I thought was brilliant from a marketing standpoint. And girl power. <laughs> <laughs> I like the girl power part. <laughs> yeah, I think um, what, what I love most about that is, you know, I think we all get caught up. I mean, if you know, we we know a lot of people that watch Fox News all day and what that can do to certain people, right? And I think, you know, even in the sports culture, uh, SMS Sports, as you know um, well, Tatiana, I feel like a lot of us follow the same forty-seven people when it comes to Twitter. When you see the same thing over and over, I know I'll be. What really enlightened me, actually, working with you, Lori and Jessica, is when we worked on the Martin Luther King campaign together. Um, I followed um, about. 10 to 15 black activists on Twitter um, just to immerse myself more in, in those discussions. And we reached out to a lot of those activists as well and had some great calls with them. Um, but I follow all those to, to this day and I've just been like, that's been in my feed. So it's kind of subconscious, but you're scrolling, you may see something, you may see a video, you may see something that I wouldn't have normally seen. So I, I also love the idea and I'm sure um, you guys over at Pop and Creative can probably help with this, but just like what every human, like the top 100 <laughs> influential people across all different diversities, um, every human should follow just to make sure you're getting, um, you know, that, that variety of content. Because it can be very easy to be in your lane and not hear anything else going on. Yeah, for sure. I think that, I mean, I, I agree. I think it was super powerful. And then we also forget about, too, that we feel like social media is like the next coming to democracy in terms of it levels of playing real. Everyone has access, all these kind of bright, shiny things. But there's inequity in social media. Like we always hear about this whole idea of sometimes black creators yeah. create something and then white creators will take it and then monetize it and then have twice 10x the followers of the black of the, of the black creator who started it. And so what happens is what I think, what I thought was really important about that is kind of, it levels the playing field in that terms of inequity. Like Kourtney Kardashian has like, I don't know what, 47, 50 million followers. And to trade with a person like Bozoma, who is who definitely has followers in her own right, but it does not look like Kourtney yeah, Kardashian. That, yeah. And yeah. so when you switch those platforms, you kind of give that, you give that place of equity to say, no, you can use this reach that I have. You can use the privilege that I have, like that have, i I've gained from being in here and I'm going to extend that to you. I think it's a powerful, I think it's a powerful display of unity and a powerful display of equity, but it is to me, it is kind of an awareness thing versus a, versus a technique or, or a, a pathway to change. It's awareness and, but awareness is important. Agreed. Agree. I, I want to say one thing quickly and then I want to ask Tatiana why she was kind of like, I don't know. Cause I'm so curious. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Um, we're not going to get away from that, Tatiana. <laughs> You're not look. No, but one thing I really uh, loved about it is that um, part of the Share the Mic uh, campaign, some women recognize it as an opportunity to educate, to your point, awareness, and some women um, celebrated. So people took different approaches depending on what you wanted your message to be. And I think all of them mm -hmm. were beautiful expressions um, of, of what's important right now in terms of valuing Black lives. So Bozema had a beautiful post with a Sade song under, under it, and she talked about being unapologetically Black and loving her melanin and, and things like that. It was just a gorgeous post. And then another woman, and I'm, I'm forgetting her name right now, I apologize, she used it to educate everyone on the Black Lives Matters, Black Lives Matter co-founders. So she didn't even post herself. She featured the three women who fa founded Black Lives Matter in order to educate people on who they are, were, why, why this mattered to them and what they're doing. And I thought that was great because we're all saying it, people are hashtagging it, but do you know who started the movement? And I think that's a great piece of education as well for everyone, not just um, you know non-Black people, but Black people as well. Yeah. I. Um... I think when I first saw it, I saw it on my former colleague, Stephanie Lynn Young, um, who is now uh, the head of um, When We All Vote, the, uh, the voting drive. And she posted it because she participated in it. And the shock factor when I just saw it in my social media feed was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, wait, wait. Why, do, why do us as black women need a white woman to open the door for us. Like, I think that's where my head immediately went to. And then I was kind of like, okay, this, this feeds right back into where we're going with this whole thing around privilege and everything else. 
But as I softened my heart for a minute, <laughs> deep breath, Wait, that heart edge. <laughs> I um, I told my husband because even in that moment, I, I was on my couch. I'm you know looking at my feet, and I, I think I took a gasp, and he was like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> and and I said, "Let me tell you what I see." You know, we had a dialogue about it, and he said, "Listen, I actually think it's a good thing." And, and he kind of you know said exactly what you said, Lori. And so. Um, um, I, I keep asking people's opinions because they they keep um, enlightening me on a different train of thought on why I think it was good, and I'm 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 coming around to it. And after seeing it, I, I said the verdict is still out because I wanted to see how it was going to be executed. And right. after I saw how it was executed, and I saw some of the ways, I didn't look at every single um, pair, but I saw a few of the ways, and I like the way that they used it, as you mentioned, for leveraging the reach to get those important messages out, so. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting because I think a lot of, you know, our community, a lot of black people are feeling like, I'm tired, like Amanda Seals is, is like, I'm not gonna educate you. I've educated myself, now it's time for you to educate you. And I think it's um, fair. I honestly think it's fair to feel that way. And I, and, and I would not begrudge anybody feeling that way, especially when you first see things. Cause it's like, why do I have to have this person? You know, but I will say I've heard, I'm not married yet. One, maybe one day, um, but um, I've heard that some marriage advice is, you know, you can fight to be right or you can fight to be together. And I think that in this scenario, I would, I would change that to say, you know, we can fight to be right because that's fair to feel that way. It's absolutely fair. Or we can fight for progress. And it's like, I think that there are going to be a lot of different feelings that everybody has. And I felt, I have felt personally inner turmoil, even about posting sometimes. I'm like, ooh, I might have some brands looking at my Instagram and what are they going to say? Am I going to look so militant? But then I feel so passionate about posting it. It's like, can I be my full self on my Instagram that's public, that's open? And it's just, it's really made me reflect a lot. And I think it's a good thing. And I've seen a shift in myself as well. And I think that a lot of people, um, no matter how we feel in the beginning, I think that it'll soften hearts everywhere um, because we'll, we'll all start to see, okay, even if I don't love the execution, even if I don't, you know, necessarily agree, I, I want this change to occur. So let's figure out how we can kind of move together and fight for, for, for progress. Yeah, I think the, the main problem we've had as a country is there's not enough diversity of opinion, diversity of news, right? I think people really believe there's people that you know, Kaepernick took a knee because he hates the military and he hates America. Well, then just leave America. How dare you do that? How dare you, mm -hmm. you know, make that after all these people? And they really, truly believe that they had no other alternate. Hey, by the way, just so you know, that's not what he's doing that for, right. um, because right. they saw much. they had they had one news source and they had the same thirteen followers on Facebook that were speaking the same the right. same narrative. So I really do think, I mean, as any human, if you watch Thirteenth on Netflix and you don't walk away from that, if you still walk away from that education, and say, ah, no, it's all it's all BS, then you're just you're we can't help you. No hope. So I, I do like <laughs> no the idea of any 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 diversity of um, thought. Of, of followers on our Twitter feed, of our news. It's, I think it's just, because even as a, I think a somewhat smart person, sometimes I come across, as we know with the fake news, you think think one thing's something and it really isn't. You're just, you've been uh, misinformed, so. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys follow, I wanna get your thoughts on the put up or shut up hashtag? Oh Hello. yeah. yeah. Now that, I think that was more in the beauty space more than anything else. Started there. But I would love to get your guys' thoughts on that because I, those of you who don't know, it was saying 72 hours for you to post your percentage of um, black people that are on, in your organization and in leadership roles at your company. And if these companies don't do it, then don't buy from them anymore. Um, yeah, I would just love to get your thoughts on if you thought that was good, if that infected change, like what what those type of movements do. Yeah, I guess I can start so, with, oh, go ahead. Jessica, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that was super interesting and it's funny how, you know, different things, different ways of social media speak to each other because I feel like that language was first expressed by Rihanna and I forgot what award that she won, but she had this speech and she was talking about this idea of this togetherness and unifying and making sure white allies actually speak up. And I think what she said was pull up, tell your friends to pull up if you really are, if you're really going to be devoted to, uh, to dismantling racism. And so that speaks to what she kind of created into this like nice quick, tight, like very marketable hashtag in terms of yeah. pull up 
set up that she was able to kind of get um, get brands to be accountable for the things that they are trying to create. I, I think it's a, I think it's amazing. The thing that I feel like, and Lori, I know you're probably going to speak to this too. We start to look at, like start to look at was these brands said it either sent it to her or put it in their IG stories or somehow she posted it. But then if you try to go back on the brand page to try to find where they posted it, sometimes you couldn't find them. Oh, I so, it's kind of, it's, so it's very interesting that, you know, and I guess if you had a great story, you, you would be able to find it. <laughs> it, would be, it would be bold and loud. But if you had a somewhat skeptical story or a, a story that even though your brand kind of commu- target, their target audience is black Americans and that side of thing, that they, if you didn't have the great story, you kind of start to hit to hide it or backpedal that. So I think it's I think it's a great way to hold brands accountable. Uh, I want I want her I would say I want her platform to get more. I wish someone would pick that up and kind of share that more because I feel like that's the conversation. That's the kind of thing that we would need in terms of help shift organizations. And it's funny because I also saw there was like a wave of that a few years ago in the tech industry. Um, Because I also spent some time at Microsoft too, and it was at that moment where all Microsoft, Facebook, Google, all the tech companies were seeing. They were, someone was like, we need to hold you all accountable and making sure that you have people of color in their ranks. And they did a similar, oh, let me show you, this is who we have, this is who we have, whatever numbers they kind of wrap together, a band-aid together. Right. But then we didn't hear any more of it. Hmm. Yeah. No one held them accountable yeah. past that. Yeah. So Jessica and I actually researched this uh, heavily. I mean, it was, it, I love the campaign. First of all, I love the page. I love what she's doing. Um, I believe she specifically said, especially brands who are benefiting financially mm-hmm. from black culture and marketing to black people specifically, um, you know, pull up or shut up. And I think that was uh, a, a a great call for transparency and I am very proud of the brands that responded because a lot of people don't want to share their numbers especially when they look, don't look good they had no time to prepare it's what do you have today um so we were going <laughs> it also was a legitimate legality issue too. calling employment lawyers and what can I say and can I I'm sure guess there's this a lot person's of- and yeah. ethnicity I don't, I'm not sure yeah it's and it's self-identified, right? So I think what companies did, some companies, they put together a quick survey so people could self-identify, right? Mm. Um, and so what's interesting, I think, there, I think there are two things that are really interesting about that. One was what Jessica said. We saw Sephora put their numbers up, and I love Sephora. I, I buy my Fenty beauty products from Sephora. <laughs> <laughs> amongst other products that I love, but they put their numbers up. They admitted to where they fell short, but then we went to the Sephora app, we went to the Sephora website, saw nothing, nothing about Black Lives Mattering, nothing about their transparency numbers, no link to it, no nothing. And because we work in digital and social, uh, we know that it's not that hard to put a message on your website that mimics the message that you're putting on social. In whatever way that made sense for the brand, they could have had some kind of acknowledgement, right? So all these brands that are on social media, talking about Black Lives Matter, if it's not on your main platforms, then it's like you're hiding in plain sight to me. Um, it's only in the social sphere. So I think that's 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 um, something I'm not, I'm disappointed in that with certain brands, but I think there's room for them to, you know, turn the corner and improve on that. They need to, you know, pull up or shut up on their main platforms, not just on social. Amen. Two, <laughs> um, I think that, you know, the other interesting thing is um, br- you can tell when brands were ashamed of their numbers because they try to highlight diversity overall. Like we have 65% people of color. We asked you about black. Yeah. We didn't ask you about everyone. I think everyone is worthy of being counted. But in this specific instance, because you market to black culture and profit financially from black uh, customers, we're asking you to show us how you have black people in your executive ranks. So some of them would have like 65% diverse and then like 2% black or 6% black or 10% black. So then the question becomes, okay, so what's your next step? What's your action mm-hmm. plan for actually creating a pathway to the executive ranks for black people? In particular, and so I love. Do you think that would have been appropriate? Do you think that's only appropriate for companies specifically benefiting off black culture? Like, do you think that would be appropriate for all companies, or would that? Because it is, it is really shaming. I think companies like all companies. You think? You what were you gonna say? You saying it's shaming? Well, I'm I'm wondering, like, is it kind of shaming people? Like, you need to fix this problem. You need to post it, and then like give me action steps. Is that the best bet for? To, to enact change for all companies or does it start like with the companies like in this movement, which was, you know, benefiting off black culture? 
I, I think she has a point. I think in the beauty space, it's very clear which companies are marketing to African Americans and black people overall, like hair companies, you know, beauty companies. She also called out like Nike and Adidas and show us your numbers, et cetera. One, I think all companies should be accountable to having executives um, that are black in a certain percentage. I think there's no reason for you not to have black executives, you know, in a, in a significant number in, in your higher ranks, period, point blank. Um, I think that every brand needs is going to have to address it differently. Some brands are super conservative. Some are not going to show their numbers. There are all kinds of things that they want to think about. But I think that the work needs to be done, whether it's internally or, or externally, period, point blank. You don't have... I would love to see your numbers, brand X, Y, Z. I would yeah. love to see those numbers um, in terms of the transparency of what's going on. Because I think that's you saying, we see the problem, we acknowledge it, we're going to create a plan of action and hold us accountable. I think the best of the brands do that. I think brands that you know don't feel they can do that for whatever reason there is, they need to at least have internal discussions amongst the executives about creating that same change internally, period, point blank. And Tatiana, I'd love to get your thoughts. Like when you see those numbers posted from brands, what are we looking for as um, for, I mean, are we looking at simply the United States population, 12% are black, at least 12% of a large company should be black. Like, I guess, what are those numbers that you guys are looking for to see if somebody's on track or off track? You know, I struggle with this one because I certainly want it to be fair. And I don't think there's a certain percentage that like, oh, X, Y, Z company or all companies need to have this certain percentage. Yeah. Um, but there's something else that's been really bothering me lately um, on this subject is I hear a lot of people say, well, we can't find qualified black people. Mm. <laughs> and that word qualified I listen to words deeply and, 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 and I, I challenge that because what makes them qualified and are you looking at them as qualified in their qualifications at the same lens that you're looking for someone who is not black being qualified and do they have the same opportunities? Did they have the same opportunities to get there? Right. So like, yes, certain positions, maybe, you know, if you look at the healthcare industry, if you if you're trying to find a doctor, you want him to be him or her to be qualified. Right. Like you need to know that they went to school for this. And I get that. Right. But in other roles, maybe let's take marketing per se. Do, what what is qualified? And as a company and an organization, if you're not creating a path and you're not investing in leadership programs to make sure that your black and brown people are qualified, then what does that statement even mean? Like, I, I get really annoyed when they say qualify. And then in the same token, you'll bring in your brother, your sister, your cousin, your neighbor's friend, who you know, who has no qualifications. Yeah. <laughs> But you hold the black person or the brown person up on this pedestal that they have to have a Harvard college education and they had to have gone to MIT and they had to have done all of these things to even get a seat at the table. And I, I, I get thrown off by that. It seems like that's yeah. an opportunity, though, to create like programs or, or help, you know, people become more qualified. I know they have supplier diversity for like... Um, auto industry and things like that. But what about other industries? What about other, um, you know, types of jobs and roles? It's like, if you're, if you feel you're not well, seeing not qualified, can we create something to establish a pipeline of helping them establish the qualifications that we, you know, feel are, are necessary? And I would, and I'll share with you guys too, like as an owner of a company, I've, you know, we've had um, job openings and I've been kind of disappointed in diversity of candidates. And um, let's say, you know, we hire, we're opening up an account manager position and a hundred people apply and there's only two black candidates and, mm. you know, they don't, they don't make it through the final round of interviews or what have you. And I think what this has taught me as a leader is everybody, every white leader wants to say, we want diversity. I would love my staff to be more diverse. I think a lot of people honestly, truly in their heart would love to have more black people working for them. I think what I've learned and talking to a lot of people in this space about this is 
it's going to take an investment. If you just post your job description up on LinkedIn and hope for the best right. that we have a ton of great black candidates like apply for this role, that's not going to it's not going to work. It's not working. That's just not. And let's be honest, like I think a lot of white people have had a 400 year head start in terms of those maybe qualifications or opportunities for growth and things like that. So that's what I've learned is it's going to take hours of reaching out, of recruitment, of going to different communities and different um, groups that um, you're looking to just diversify your your pool. And that's why I think when it comes to money and time and investment, a lot of companies are like, ah, just throw it up on LinkedIn. And that's when the, the problem is, per, you know, continues. And David, when you and I were talking, weren't you yeah. telling me about if you had two candidates, one was white, one was, but you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I was enlightened by, and I, these are great conversations I think to have. I said, let's say we're in the final round of interview um, for whatever position, and there's a list of criteria, and let's say they're white candidates and 95 at 100. They're, they check all the boxes, the qualifications, mm -hmm. the, the history. They have a great book of business from their former role, what have you. And the second runner up is a black candidate. Maybe they're 80 out of 100. They're just a few, but they don't have a lot of experience or what, what it may be. What do you do in that situation? And one of my great friends enlightened me, he said, you hire them both. <laughs> That's the investment you make is you run them through wow. your organization and the 80 you bring up to a 95. Um, and, and help. That's how you add, if you're really true by diversity and making a change, that's the type of investment. Well, I only have money for one role. Like, well, that's, that's the investment. If you really want to change, you're going to have to make investments like that in order to do it, which I thought was a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to add to that, there was something really, um, I, I struggle with this whole pipeline issue that companies claim to have and that sort of thing. Yeah. Cause with all the technology in the world, all the resources in the world, like why is this, you know, why is this real, really a problem that no one has solved for? Uh, especially like with platforms like LinkedIn. I'll just say this in terms of one thing that I saw that was really interesting. There's been a lot of uh, crowdsourcing, I feel like, opportunities, especially around pipeline, and especially around making sure black talent gets seen by, you know, hiring managers or people who are, look, who are interested in hiring folks. And like people are taking upon themselves to even create like their own Google Sheets and Google Docs that are just getting yeah. passed around from person to person on LinkedIn saying, here's one for, uh, here's one for agencies. Um, Have you guys seen actually, Blacks, Bla Blacks Who Design? There is like a huge website. Yeah. I'll have to send it to you guys, but it's really cool. I saw so it's funny because I haven't I haven't seen the website, but I saw a whole Twitter thread about like it was similar in that name, Black Suit Design or Black Suit, yeah. like Black Writers and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of these like random grassroots crowdsourcing efforts that are going on where people are like, this is the problem. I can't solve everything, but guess what I can do? I can create this little Google sheet. I can put it, give me some categories and I can pass it around. And it's actually there. Mm -hmm. If you look at them, they're actually full of people with like information, titles, you know, portfolio links and everything, which I think is really powerful because of the, the companies top down, like, oh, it's too hard. This is too hard. But these people right here who can just help solve the issues with a Google sheet. There's a gap. Yeah. I want to do a quick plug to my my good friend Shina Wow, who um, leads minorities in sports business, and she has a pool of Black people in the sports industry who are either looking to get into the industry or already yeah. in it. So, for those in my industry, if you're in sports and you're looking for Black people, please reach out to minorities in sports business. Shana <laughs> wow. Yeah. This Especially in the uh, in the NBA too, like there's this. I think there's no excuse at the at the team level as well. Um, you know, when when the majority, obviously, of the athletes too are, are are black, like there there's there's such a pool, and that that's what I mean. I think you know having a lot of business owner friends and and a lot of different entrepreneurs that I know. I think it it takes the investment and the extra time. And I think Tatiana, I'd love for you to talk about, which was enlightening for me, is like what is your intent? Like again, do you wish and hope and pray? that one day your your staff is more diverse or are you actually going to be intentional with action? I know Lori and Jessica, you guys have a guide coming out on that too, but Tatiana, I'd love for you to speak on your thoughts on that. Yeah, when, um, when mm. this whole thing went down, um, and if I can just be transparent, uh, there are four b vice presidents within my organization. I'm one of four of color. Mm. And... So of course we were looked to for how do we right this wrong, right? So we said, as the four of us got together and said, okay, let's help them establish some action plans. And we literally looked at every single aspect 
of our business and really um, created some actionable items that we think the company needs to address. And that was everything from our, our Black employees being fairly compensated to are they, um, do we have programs and pipelines that we talked about, like, do we start early? Do we align with um, like uh, here in Indiana, IPS, you know, the Indiana Indianapolis public school systems to create job shadowing programs for young people of color um, within our company? You know, are we thinking about our marketing campaigns and looking at that they are totally diverse? Like we looked at every single lens of our business. And the other piece of it is I think all companies at this point need to take a deep look at their mission and values and purpose as a company and really ask themselves as CEOs and owners, like, am I living up to my company's mission statement and my company's value? And when you really look at that, it's like, okay, if my mission statement is we are one, which a lot of companies have that, right? Oh, we are one. But then you look at the partners that your company aligns with or the sponsors that your company aligns with and they all look a certain type of way. Are we really one? Or if you look at your leadership board and there's no people of color, are we really one? (laughs) You know what I mean? So like, I think people need to really um, take another look in this time of discovery and self-reflection and and moment of pause and silence to really do a deep dive to make sure that our mission and values as brands and as companies are completely aligned on all aspects of the business. So true. So, so true. What are some other th- steps you think brands in terms of, um, we talked about blind spots a lot as well. Um, I think some people, I think there's a lot of excuses out there that can be made, but um, in terms of leadership, diversity of staff, um, Lori, I would love to get your thoughts on, we were ta- I think we were talking before the podcast started about just some blind spots that people, <laughs> people may just have innately. Yeah, and I, and I would love to hear Tatiana's too. I'm so glad we talked briefly about that, but um you know, the blind spots are really hard to identify, obviously. That's why they're called blind spots. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think that you have to take it upon yourself to educate yourself and to assume that you have them. I think there is a huge assumption that you don't for most people, um, including all of us. Like, you have to assume there's a blind spot somewhere within you that you need to course correct, educate, become aware of, um, and then try to overcorrect, you know, how you've approached um, or haven't approached, you know, that blind spot in the past. Um, I I was on a panel for Promax and we talked about blind spots. Um, And Lisa, I think her name was Tabo, Lisa Tabo, I hope I didn't butcher her name. She spoke a lot about that and I think she has um, a a book or something like that about it. And it was really interesting because even amongst the panelists, there were only like three or four of us, we disagreed on whether there were blind spots or not. So you think that everybody could be self-aware enough to say, of course I have a blind spot. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe I ask a friend, maybe I ask someone who's um, close to me, kind of like, what am I missing? Um, but some people truly don't feel that they have that. And I think that's a problem. And I, and I feel like companies and corporations need to assume there are blind spots. Even if you can't fully get on board with the fact that your company might have benefit benefited from some sort of racial inequality, race, racism, et cetera, you have to assume there's a blind spot in terms of the path of leadership if you know that your numbers don't look great enough to post or your numbers don't look great enough to share publicly. And, and I'm not saying that every company has to, but you should assume there's a blind spot and then figure out how to tackle that. Invite people within the company to the table from different backgrounds. That's the whole point of diversity, yeah. diversity of thought, diversity of background. You can have five black people that are completely different in background because no one race is a monolith bring people to the table. Don't just bring one black person or one black executive and you know, the rest white executives and then one Asian person and then one, you know, 
um, gay person, you know, like yeah. bring multiple people within a certain demographic because they're all going to have differences of opinions. And that's how we create change. I think one uh, point that um, Tatiana mentioned as well is like, you know, you'll hire your friend or like, do you know anybody that's good for this role? And I think I was talking to one of my friends, uh, another black leader in the space too. And she mentioned that, you know, if you, the more black people you hire, the more likely that they're going to say, I got a friend and odds are potentially they're black rather than yes. white. And that starts to kind of that snowball effect so starts true. to happen. I, I actually um, had a Tatiana, do, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just interject really quick. It. I had, I had a recruiter that um, approached me for a position, um, an executive position, and got to, you know, the final rounds. And then she asked for references. And, you know, I had a mix of people, you know, in terms of uh, how they knew me, what phase of my career they knew me from, also a mix of races, you know, by, by happenstance. Um, but anyway, when she reached out to three of the black people on my reference list at the end of the call, she asked them, so are you looking for something? Cause I would love wow. to play you. And she literally <laughs> used that as her own pipeline, knowing That's that smart. if, if so smart, um, <laughs> knowing that if she found a talent, you know, that, that maybe that talented person would have friends um, who are also equally talented and oh my gosh, she has, you know, friends who are black and equally as talented. And let me just go ahead and see how I can create more of a pipeline, you know? And I, and I feel like it was interesting because I'd never seen a recruiter try to recruit <laughs> on a reference, a reference. call. Before. But I'm not mad at her because she's like, oh, here's some pretty great people and some pretty talented people. And I'm hearing them speak. I'm, I'm hearing their philosophies. And let me see what I can do for them as well. Can, when we talk about blind spots, um, I think it also goes to privilege. Mm. All of us have a sense of privilege, black, brown, white, green, whoever you are, you all have some form of privilege, right? So I grew up in a middle to lower class um, mixed uh, environment, mix of black, white, Hispanic, and, and that's Mexican Hispanic, if we want to get <laughs> into the details. Um, and so I have a certain degree of privilege that I come with because I did not grow up in the projects. Mm -hmm. However, I have cousins who grew up in the projects. So they look at me like, oh, you don't understand our struggles. And I think those are the mm -hmm. blind spots that we talk about is checking your own privilege to realize that there may be some things that you don't understand because you haven't lived there and you haven't experienced it. And I think if we can all just realize that we have those blind spots and admit it and be open to just hearing other people's perspective, that would open so many more doors in life. We were having a leadership call um, a couple days ago and I, I have to tell you, I'm so proud of my company. I'm so proud of Pacer Sports and Entertainment for how they have been willing to just step up and realize where they went wrong and take a stance on trying to make an attempt to fix it. I'm so proud of my company right now. Um, proud of uh, Rick um, Fusion, our president, Herb Simon, our owner, Steve Simon, everyone in our company. Um, and for allowing our employees to be open and honest about what they're experiencing and going through. But we were on a call and someone said, but we as a company, we, you know, we embrace all. When um, gay rights was an issue, we had a campaign uh, called Indie Welcomes All. And we took a hard stance. We were the first organization in Indiana to take a stance about Indie welcomes all. So yeah, we're doing it. And I said, but wait a minute, listen for one second to what you're saying and just hear me out. I said, if you think about that, you are willing as a company to take a public stance in saying that you support people in their sexuality, but at some point in time, you were never willing to take a personal stance and mm. say black lives matter. Mm. That's a great point. You know what I mean? So are you really welcoming all? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're willing to accept sexuality, but you're not willing to accept race. 
That's great. Publicly, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that's that's the blind spots that I think they didn't even think about. But then once you took a step back and just listened and, and open your heart to hearing someone else's perspective, then they thought about it and was like, well, maybe you're right. Hmm. <laughs> and maybe we should publicly acknowledge that we believe saying those three words, Black Lives Matter, is not a negative or derogatory thing. It's a, a humanity thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing that we just believe that all people should be treated fairly. And so my company embraced it. <laughs> we use Black Lives Matters now on our channel, and I'm proud of them for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I do, I guess I would love to, to close with... Um, the hope that I guess all all four of us have. Um, I think this has caused a, I don't know, I don't know how you guys feel. I feel like, and, and I'm 33, so I feel like um, maybe I'm speaking at a turn here, but I, I mean, with the coronavirus and this movement, I kind of feel like we're in the Great Depression slash 9-11 slash Rodney King slash civil rights movement all, <laughs> all in one. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I saw a quote recently how 2020, is not the year to be canceled, but the year that it enlightened all of us and was arguably one of the, maybe this is one of the biggest years ever in the history of our country, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I, 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 I do have hope that, that we have changed. Do you guys think that it starts, um, I'll start with you, Jessica. Um, do you just think it starts like individual, individual, company to company? And that just, again, we talked about the snowball effect earlier. That's just gonna be able to fix this main problem we have a lot faster than maybe defunding the police or putting more money towards a uh, NAACP or ALCU like what are your what are your thoughts on how we can affect change as we move forward I feel like I'm taking the safe option but I feel like it really is a, on both and I say that because these big institutions like let's be real this is America we operate we operate by money and capitalism drives a lot of our decision making kind of yep. in this world and in this space mm -hmm. so if you don't have big companies willing to speak out and say this is wrong and to say nope we need to stop this we need to address this we need the funds to go this way versus that way if you don't have people in power um, advocating for those decisions whether they be people people of power of color or, or otherwise if you don't have people in power pushing that agenda along and making sure that people don't just go back to business as usual yeah. i think i feel like things fail but to you know we we're talking about this whole idea of like the amy coopers of the world if you don't have an individual if you don't have a task individually to check yourself and to check your blind spots that you may have and to check the privilege that you may have on your you know looking in the mirror each day if you don't start there they can't maintain it the institutions can't maintain it institutions are maintained by individual people and individual actions so you have to kind of go you have to like you have to start in two places and meet in the middle you got to change yourself, your actions, and how you look at things. But you need those institutions to speak up. Lori? Yeah. Um, sorry, I was so tracking with Jessica. I'm like, can you just ask a specific <laughs> question one more time? <laughs> I'm sitting here and, like, I, and yes. I'm fully aware like, that I'm asking minute, I you. I want to make sure I fully answered the question. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm fully aware I'm asking you guys a very loaded question that's impossible to solve in a, a minute answer. But yeah, just like, I guess, you know, I, all, all of our biggest fear on this call and a lot of my staff and, and, and people I'm around is like, this can't stop. Like next week, like you said, when the protests stop, we can't just go back to normal and people made their, their donations and that now we're good. Like, no, it has to be a consistent effort as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but how do, we, how, how do you think we can just remind ourselves every day that we, do, that we are making that effort? Yeah, I, I think it's gonna it's, it's gonna requ I think it's going to require companies to be vulnerable to to the communities that they uh, serve to the employees that they have. Um, I think that Black employees, you know, should definitely be given that voice and and, and have their voice sustained. I don't I don't think that the audience with the CEOs and the executives should be taken away once they've had their town hall or once they've had their post. Or once they, you know, uh, created the action plan. What's the ongoing check-in um, that you're going to have, and then how are you going to judge that success of what you're doing? Um, diversity is not a nice to have. It's a it, it's it's necessary for business. It's necessary for business, and if that's the case, and if your company feels as all companies should feel that Black Lives Matter, just like you know. 
every life matters, but especially Black Lives Mattering, then you need to put some real milestones, you know, on the table and then allow your employees and vendors or external people to hold you accountable. I'm a part of um, Nielsen's executive, I'm sorry, Nielsen's external advisory council for African Americans. They have them for different ethnic groups. So there's, you know, uh, La uh, Latin American, there Asian American, and, and uh, I'm shortening the titles, but you know, we have different external advisory councils. That's Nielsen inviting outside people in hmm. to advise them on their blind spots to call out how they can better these communities that they serve and that they profit from because they do profit from all of these uh, ethnicities and, and communities because they're getting ratings from all of them, right? And they're selling those ratings. Um, and, and we are allowed, we are given the permission, we are given that, that audience with the CEO, CFO, the executive leadership overall to say, this isn't good enough. We want 10% supplier diversity, year at eight, mm. pull up. And, yeah. and, and, and the, the executives will tell us why they can or cannot do that. And we are able to, to kind of push them where they need to be pushed. And I think it says volumes, it speaks volumes to a company like Nielsen that they allow that, that uh, audience with them and that they actually really listen. And they have a new CEO, David Kinney, and he's phenomenal. And I just am so thankful that I've seen a great example of that from a you know, multi-billion dollar company um, that I hope that other companies follow suit in terms of allowing the voice of the community you serve, the voice of your customers, the voice of your employees to be actionable and not just once, but throughout your, your, your company's life. Yeah, I was uh, talking the other day that you know, I feel like as a country, we can only focus on one thing at a time. Like obviously during COVID-19, me medical doctors, politicians, PPE providers, yeah. everybody was focused on COVID-19. Now, right. cancer is still important. HIV is still important. Sex trafficking and hunger. All these are all, these are all huge things we have to mm -hmm. focus on, but we were all zeroed in on COVID-19. And I think when it comes to Black Lives Matter, I know there's a lot of different topics throughout different races and different uh, things going on, but I feel like we have to focus for yes. a very legitimate amount of time on this um, because this is the broken thing that we know it's happening, we know it's terrible, and we all have to kind of get together to help make right. a huge change. Um, Tatiana, I'll let you continue that. I, I just think that um, it starts in our homes. I think it starts with us undoing um, the years, as Lori mentioned, the 400 plus years of us not loving each other as people. Mm -hmm. And it starts, um, there's, there's a post going around on social media of, um, of a father showing his son, they both were white, obviously, <laughs> um, showing his son images four different images and it's a couple of um, kids in the photos, his age, and they're black and white. And he starts asking his son, what do you see in this photo? And his son's like, oh, grass. I see a boy, yeah. I see a girl, I see this, I see that. At no point did that little boy say he saw color mm -hmm. or race. And it goes back to racism is not born, it's taught. Yep. And I also believe that it can be innately in you and you could still give it. My niece is 17 and she lives in Minnesota. I don't see her on a day-to-day -day basis, but this girl is like my mini me. Like she thinks the way I think, she acts the way I act, like she sounds like me. And there's something within our bloodline <laughs> that carries that on. And so I think that we have to change that piece of it. If all of us as, as a community of people in the, within the entire world commit to just loving each other, we can change that for generations to come. Yes. And if we also, and we also can help bring about the undoing of the systematic injustices that have been put in place. So that's what I, I want us to get back to. Let's just love each other. <laughs> love is the think, answer. I'm with that. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think too, like the a challenge I have for all white people really is the difficult conversation. Like you mentioned, Tatiana, I'll, I'll share a quick example. My father's in the military, 23 years, special forces, fought in operation during freedom after 9-11. 
And the Kaepernick stuff really, really upset him. He was very, very, and I had to have a very difficult conversation with him back in 2016 with tears in my father's eyes because this is how passionate he was about it. Like, Dad, that's not why he's kneeling, man. Let me explain to you why this is happening. Let me tell you some stories. And my dad's a very, he's my hero. He's one of, very educated. He was just not educated on that topic. And I think having those conversations, again, allows that diversity of opinion and kind of allows people to not just hear from one source, their neighbor, their friend, but just having those difficult conversations, I think is what we can, what we all can do. Um, and I wanted to pull this quote up too, which I think would be good to kind of end it all. Be not afraid of growing slowly, be afraid of standing still. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, I'll lean on all three of you as my friends and colleagues in the space to, yes. to hold me accountable as well. And, and I'll, I'll continue to listen and um, get your advice and thoughts as, as I try to grow as a, as a human, as a leader and all those things. And just thank you so much for the time. And I think this is super enlightening for a lot of people. Thank, thank you, David. For awesome. this. Thank you. Thanks, team. All right, we'll see you soon. Bye. All right, bye. All right. Bye.